Okay, let's go ahead and get started. Good afternoon, good people. I'm Dr. Mills, an assistant professor in higher ed and student affairs. I'm so happy that you chose to spend your lunch hour with us today as we kick off the diversity lecture series for the 2022-23 academic year. Um, this year, we are starting with a presentation titled Mixed Methods, a diversifying research to introduce multiple perspectives of a phenomenon really excited to have uh, members to share with us today and I'm going to turn it over to the presenters. Um, feel free to drop questions or comments in the chat at the close of the presentation. I will help facilitate that process. Um, if you prefer to unmute, please use the hand raise function um, and we will call on you to ask your question. With that said, let's turn it over. Hi, thank you, Kristen. We appreciate um, the invitation to share our work. Um, and welcome everyone um, to our presentation on mixed methods, the title of which is Mixed Methods Diversifying Research to Introduce, introduce Multiple Perspectives of a Single Phenomenon. Joining me today are Artie Ballara and Su Jung Lin. Both, all three of us use um, mixed methods or have used mixed methods in our research in um, various different ways. So we're gonna talk about not only um, our research, but also how mixed methods has evolved and, and the different perspectives that are in the field currently. So our plan for today is obviously an introduction of who we are and where uh, we use mixed method or how we use mi mixed method and also what sorts of research or who does mixed methods? Um, what is the research methodology and why do it? Um, we also want to talk a little bit about in research where the mixing occurs and can occur, and then we'll have a little activity at the tail end of a mixed method study. So you can engage in some of the um, dynamics of mixed methods research. As I stated, my name is Dr. Karen Stansberry Beard. I'm an associate professor in education administration here in the College of Education and Human Ecology. Joining me today are Artie Ballara and Su Jung Lin. Um, briefly, before I turn it over to Artie, I'll just share that um, in my research, because I look at minority education and in particular gaps in achievement, um, mixed methods came to me. Um, well, I, I take it on in one of two ways. One, so much of that research in my in minority education comes from a deficit perspective. So there's always this trend down or um, uh, a movement downward. And so when I see that, I like to look for what we call in quant methods, an outlier. Um, who's doing something different and what is it that they're doing? And then qualitatively, I go in and investigate. And that's where I can do interviews and have conversations um, with individuals, uh, superintendents, pr primarily um, principals, about what they are uniquely doing strat strategically to uh, turn the tide on some of those issues that we know are barriers to um, not only minority education, candidly, but students who struggle in education could be special ed, special ed students, special needs students, and it also uh, students from low socioeconomic backgrounds. So when I see there's a um, something that's different than what the norm is showing itself to be in the work, I want to pursue that with the intention of informing the field that there's another way. The other way that I use mixed method is from a single story. When I hear a single story or about an event that's going on, uh, particularly we just did this, I just did this with a graduate student around discipline and how, you know, um, black girls were being disciplined in a unique, you know, um, well, I shouldn't say in a unique, a unique way, but when the voice of Black girls was starting to come forward, then I wanted to make it known. I wanted to make it bigger. So from a single story, then taking it to quantifying it and saying that this reality is not an isolated situation or case, and it's something in education we need to consider and take a look at. So that's how I use mixed methods. Um, it's usually what we call a sequential design, which means that the findings of one informs the research design of the second application of the research. Artie? Thank you so much. Um, I uh, was introduced to mixed methods early in my doctoral career um, when I was a PhD student. I um, Lots of my research is on methodology. And so 
um, what works um, for and what methods work under which conditions. And I sort of gravitated towards measurement and measurement is sort of one part science in terms of the math and the statistics behind how we measure things. But another part of it is art and we're really understanding what it is people are thinking and doing and understanding about um, what it is we're trying to measure. And so I use mixed methods a lot in my um, sort of methodological work and to try and understand when we're designing and developing measures. If you wanted to measure, um, you know, school climate or you wanted to measure um, uh, uh, teachers' perceptions about something, um, I would use qualitative methods, um, interviews to understand how people respond to certain items so that we can ensure that we are asking items um, that are fair, that are um, measurable, and that would give us information that would help us to improve that phenomenon. And then secondly, I do use mixed methods um, substantively. So when I do send out a really large survey and I understand um, how a lot of people are thinking about some things, we will sort of identify um, um, something that sticks out, like um, Karen was saying, an outlier, or just something that wasn't what we had theorized. And we'll try and unpack that a little bit more through a qualitative lens to sort of understand the situation and the context um, behind what is happening when we do large group studies. Thank you, uh, Dr. Lin. Sure. Hi, my name is Zhong Lin. I'm an associate professor of educational psychology and um, I do mixed methods research because most of my studies are conducted in classroom or school settings. Uh, we design instructional approaches and curriculum and collaborate with teachers to implement these instructions and curriculum. Um, so part of our research questions are not just about whether these interventions will work or um, how effective are these curriculum. Uh, we are also interested in how learning occurs, how the, uh, the teacher teaching process um, contribute to student learning. So it's a lot, um, there are a lot of focuses on the processes rather than um, more so than outcomes. And because of um, the focus of theories and practices, processes and outcomes, uh, mixed methods allow us to answer these multiple questions at the same time. So, oh, Hardy, do you want to say something? No, go ahead. Oh, I'm going to introduce this next one. Uh, next topic, uh, what, who are doing mixed methods? Who are these uh, prominent scholars? And Artie um, is going to introduce the first two. Um, uh, so Dr. Tony Anwe Buzi is a um, is sort of a giant in the mixed methods field. One of the um, giants of who I would love to eventually in my career say I stood on his shoulders. Um, he definitely comes from a quant background, and his focus is on trying to understand how to um, get more information to contextualize um, uh, and understand what is going on. But he is a trained quantitative. Um, educational psychologist. And this is John Creswell. He is a leader in mixed methods design. Um, what John Creswell did uh, for the field was develop different approaches to mixing, um, definitely mixed methodology research, including the sequential expl explanatory design, which is the one that I told you I lean into, exploratory design, which is another one that was part of my dissertation work. So when I want to just explore a phenomenon, I will use um, the mixed method so that I can get a broader a view of what I think may be happening and can substantiate it both quantitatively and qualitatively. So he um, came up with, well, he, he brought forward the designs around um, the, the um, uh, sequential explanatory, the sequential exploratory. Then he uses what's called the tr sequential transformative design. 
and then concurrent tri triangulation. Those other three are sequential, as I stated, where one finding then informs the, the follow-up questions. And then in the concurrent triangulation, and somebody noted triangulation in the, in the chat already, um, but in the concurrent triangulation is when you are collecting data at the same time. And then you're using that data to not only inform um, the, you know, from your findings, but also to check you know, which, what makes sense about the data and that part of the triangulation process. He uses concurrent nested design and concurrent transform transformative design. And um, while well, Anwei Buzi and Creswell focus um, a lot on how to do mixed methods research, we think that it's important to introduce Bert Biestad who comes from a more philosophical educational um, perspective, providing us a broader view of why we are doing mixed methods and um, what are the values of doing mixed methods compared to um, the traditional dichotomy between quantitative and qualitative methodologies. And Bert Biestad has a um, strong theoretical um, educational theoretical backgrounds, and he's also an educational philosopher. So now let's move on to our next topic. What is mixed methods? And Artie, um, here you go. Yep. Um, so uh, Dr. Anwei Buzi talks about mixed methods as a combination of quantitative and qualitative approaches um, to a research methodology of a single or multi-phase study. A lot of his work is um, about triangulating, um, as uh, Heather has asked about, um, both um, uh, sort of quant and qualitative uh, data um, and analyses to come to a specific outcome. Um, and he talks about the variety of designs um, and, and how they are not, um, um, uh, um, the designs are not dependent on the, um, the analyses are not dependent on the particular design. We can um, analyze uh, the different sort of, um, uh, what was I saying? The um, the different designs that Karen had talked about, um, we we have a few slides later. He's talking about the analyses um, is really meant to what is um, going to answer the research question. Um, and that he does talk about how quantitative data can be subjected to qualitative um, techniques, as well as how qualitative data can be subjected to quantitative techniques. And one example of that is to um, sort of take qualitative data and run counts on codes, um, or take quantitative data and really um, try to um, put them into themes, something like that. So um, with that understanding of how, um, how we go about thinking about our research, how we go about presenting the particular and appropriate research to answer a variety of questions, uh, because that's one of the major and key points of mixed methods, and, well, any research actually, is it actually getting to the answer of the question? So the question really drives, of course, the research. And then with the question comes assumptions. There are quantitative assumptions, which are predetermined and usually instrument-based, as already mentioned, you know, survey type, uh, where you're getting large numbers of people who and getting their sense or perspective of, you know, climate or, or a, a an, an event that's gone on or something where you're measuring. And then also there's performance, attitude, observational and census data that's in that quantitative assumption. It usually relies on statistical analysis and statistical interpretation. On the opposite side of that, and I don't like to use the word opposite because I do think um, one thing I do want to say here is that quantitative and qualitative methodologies for, for whatever reason have been set in opposition to one another. And it was not introduced, research was not introduced to me that way. So that has always felt very odd um, because my dissertation was a mixed methods study based on the questions that I wanted to, to, to get answered. I never really sat in one place or another and just learned that as a researcher, I would have to develop high skills in both and then know how to answer questions based on what was the appropriate uh, assumption. So then on the qualitative side of this, you have emerging methods, 
um, which we talked about earlier, already talked about some of the emergent themes that may be coming up in, in, in uh, recording of analysis, and then open-ended questions, interviews and observations are where I lean heavily, and most people who do classwork, field work do also, observation, documentation, audiovisual data, text and image analysis and interviewing, obviously, and then we're looking for themes, patterns, in, themes and patterns in that interpretation. And then the mixed methods assumptions in the middle are predetermined and emerging methods. So they're both. And then they are both open and closed, open-ended questions. There's multiple forms of data drawing on many different possibilities. And our exploration, in, in, in my case, usually it's an exploration, is to find out what possibilities um, hold teeth, what, what possibilities seem to be the most relevant and true to a phenomenon. So they are statistical and text, both. And then also across database, there's an interpretation across the entire database, which means that you're doing interpretation, uh, going back to that question in the chat about triangulation. So you're doing an interpretation quantitatively and then possibly triangulated uh, qualitatively and or vice versa. So why do mixed methods research? Party. <laughs> Sorry, this is me. Um, so one of the reasons we do mixed methods research is it affords us the opportunity to explore the phenomenon by investigating or integrating different perspectives. So when we come from a quant background where we're looking at what is going on with the entire um, sort of population or subpopulation, um, and that gives us a very broad view. And then when we want to sort of hone in, we may come in with a uh, sort of a qualitative perspective that is trying to understand um, what is happening and what is going on with different um, sort of um, phenomenon. Um, so when we, when an investigator combines both the statistical trends and stories, um, that combination provides a, a, a more holistic understanding of the problem than either one of those can independently. Um, and one thing I note is that, uh, or I've, I've found, is that I've noticed that um, mixed methods research sometimes is now, is not always um, presented as mixed methods research. Sometimes you'll see a quant study and then a follow-up um, qual study. Um, and you can sort of put by the same authors, but you can put it together and see that they really did this as sort of a larger agenda of their research. Um, and so um, I look out for that too, when I am um, sort of uh, combing the literature to um, understand my problem a little bit better. Um, and another reason that we do mixed methods research is it allows um, researcher to use the strengths of both quantitative and qualitative to understand the phenomenon better. Both of those analytical sets um, actually have lots of pros, but they also have lots of shortcomings and cons. And we are able to sort of get the pros of both to be able to get more out of the data, understand what is really going on in that phenomenon to get a richer, broader, um, and sometimes um, more confusing. We, we may not really understand or solve the problem, but just getting more information to um, help us understand what um, is going on in our research. And, and drawing from Berbiesa's perspective, why are we doing mixed methods? Um, and he really drew on John Dewey's pragmatism theory, um, thinking about knowing as a way of doing. And doing requires action. So when we try to understand um, what's going on in the with a phenomenon, um, we it requires action. It requires thinking. It's both the thinking and action that constitute our experience. And it's the experience that constitutes knowledge. So based on this philosophical um, understanding of the traditional dualistic dichotomy between mind and world may not be as important considering the type of questions that we are trying to solve. So uh, what we mean, uh, what he meant by mind world scheme was thinking about the knower as the, the subjectivity and the world as the objectivity. And oftentimes when people think about qu uh, quantitative research, they relate that to objectivity. Um, interventionist 
um, the, the methodology is to understand um, the truth that exists in the world. Whereas the knowledge within the knower, that's the complete opposite of objectivity, which is subjectivity. So subjectivity, um, if that constitutes knowledge, then what, um, what, what can researchers know or do to extract people's thinking? Um, and for um, Bert Biesa, he thinks that just focusing on the knower, the subjectivity in the world, the objectivity may not be enough because um, uh, most of the time, um, what, what we count as knowledge or the sense of knowing is actually the interaction between the two, is the interaction between the knower and the world. And that's the transaction idea that makes mixed methods um, an important approach to help us pursue knowledge and to en enjoy this process of knowing. So now uh, let's talk about where does mixing occur? And uh, Artie, that's you again, right? Yeah. Um, so mixing can happen at any point in the research design. We can mix at the research question. We can mix at um, the data collection. We can mix at uh, the um, uh, data analysis and also at the interpretation. Um, I was giving a presentation once where I collected um, uh, I thought it was a qualitative design where I collected what people um thought about a certain thing. I had them go through a um, sort of a, uh, uh, an activity and what they thought at at the end. And um, while my data itself was qualitative, um, some people had pointed out to me that the pre post design with the intervention or activity in between is very much a sort of a quantitative approach to data. Um, and so um, the mixing could happen at any um, at any phase. Um, it's not just about collecting quantitative and qualitative data. Um, it's uh, it's about thinking about where the mixing is occurring, um, and it does require skills in both quantitative and qualitative methodologies to understand um, and to do a good job. And so often, mixed methods are not done by a single person, um, but they are done by um, a group of researchers that bring different sort of um, perspectives um, to, to diversify the research and um, help to understand how to answer some of those research questions. And so um, looking at some of the designs that we mentioned uh, earlier, when you think about how this works, there could be the quantitative data collection with quantitative data analysis and quantitative results, and then the qualitative data analysis, qualitative data um, design, collection, excuse me, collection analysis and findings. And then we look to the interpretation and we merge the quant and qual results then to be compared. So that's one, it's called the conver convergent design. The second is the explanatory sequential design, which is this one and the exploratory, the ones that I mentioned earlier, where you use the quantitative data collection, the analysis, and then the results to trigger a new series of collection questions possibly for response and then that collection, the analysis and the findings, and then you land in your interpretation where one is actually, the findings of one is actually informing the other in an explanatory sequential design. And then finally, in the exploratory, which I also mentioned, it's very similar, the same, same sort of way where the qualitative exploration leads to a quantitative test in this way, where you start with the qualitative, you pull that, in, that, that data, you analyze that data and the findings, and then you say, okay, if this is happening in this situation, where else? And how much more? Or how, is, how prevalent is this phenomenon occurring? And that leads then to your final interpretation. And this is just, a, um, and I know it's not perfect, but it's one of Creswell's um, tables on design types that I've kind of gone through. And then the implementation, the priority, the priority really in 
where you start. Do you start with quantitative or do you start with qualitative or do you collect equally at the same time? Is it a concurrent? And then also the stage of integration, which I think is important. And could it be, as Artie mentioned, are you, are you integrating um, in your initial posing of questions or is it typically in the interpret or interpretation state phases? Creswell tends to lean more into the interpretation phases and what all of the data means when it is all put together. Um, and then the theoretical perspectives that Su Jung mentioned, he also, um, I recognize and says, yeah, well, it could be present in the sequential, present maybe in the, in the uh, ex explanatory or the exploratory, it's definitely present in the sequential. Um, so these are just, this is just a, a nice little mapping of the different design types, the implementation priority and the stages of integration. All right, and then going back to Biesta's conceptualization of mixed methods. If the purpose of mixed methods is to understand the transactional process between the knower and the world, then mixing really can happen at any level of the research process as the other two um, mixed methods scholars has, have mentioned. Um, but um, we want to share this seven level layout to you, um, not to say that mix, mixing can happen at all these levels. Uh, what we are trying to say is when we do a mixed methods research, we have to consider all these levels where does mixing occur. It may occur at some of the levels, but not all. Um, and another point that we would like to um, emphasize here is that oftentimes people determine whether this is a mixed method only by um, the service level, level one, two, or even level three. But it's um, the, the type of data that you collect, the type of method that you do, and even the, the type of research design you do are, um, are not the deterministic factor to, um, to justify whether you are doing mixed methods because all of these data methods and design are driven by certain epistemology, certain ontological beliefs. And the most important things um, that uh, Bert, Bert Biesta tries uh, to emphasize is that all of these are driven by the purpose of research and the practical roles of research. Is the purpose of research to explain a phenomenon or is to understand a phenomenon? is the practical role of research to develop a tool for practitioners, or is it to contribute to some scientific understanding or theoretical break, uh, breakthrough? And oftentimes, um, educational researchers emphasize the, both, both theory and practice, and both explanation and understanding. And that's why mixed methods becomes important. So um, uh, in a minute, I'm going to assign us to um, breakout rooms for three with that will have three to four participants. Um, and for, for just 10 minutes, you are going to talk about um, the mixing that is going on in this um, uh, in this first study, the, the link over there that I think uh, Dr. Lin will put into the chat that you can, um, but she's gonna introduce it in a second before we go into those breakout rooms. So just, just to be um, on the note that we will be in breakout rooms for about 10 minutes. Yes, and so um, give me one second to share this link. I have to um, turn off the share mode. And while she's doing that, I just want to remind you as you're looking at this activity to be thinking about those two dichotomies that exist, um, differentiation and integration, and the mixing, uh, how mixing can respond to the case or the situation um, in the understanding of differentiation and integration, which mixed, mixed studies does a nice job of. Okay, thank you, Karen. Yep. <clears throat> So um, I hope you can all access this AERA poster. Um, this was presented in 2022, uh, this past April, um, with, under a mixed method SIG. Um, the research focuses on teachers' well-being. And the purpose of this study is to develop a scale that can um, um, 
um, a, a major or understand teacher well-being with validity and reliability. Um, but to do so, they recognize that teacher well-being is a construct that can be understood in multiple ways. And it's uh, also affected by cultural situational factors. So um, they conducted, they collected both quantitative data and qualitative data. They also came up with both quantitative and qualitative research questions. Um, what's um, very attractive to us is um, there's one research question that focuses on the integration of qualitative and quantitative questions. So in this breakout room, um, we will uh, invite you to talk about the design of this study, where does missing occur, what's the purpose of this mixed methods research, and then after 10 minutes, we'll come back to do a, a quick debrief. Engaging in that, I do want, if you have any questions about the activity itself, please direct those. We'll have a minute to talk to Sue Young about those. And then also um, about the presentation or about mixed methods following that. If you have any lines of questioning uh, for us in that, we are happy to entertain those questions as well. Sue Young? Mm -hmm. All right. So um, we would like to end today's session with another mixed method study example. And I'm going to show share screen in, in 30 seconds. Are you able to see this poster? OK, great. Um, and we have, oh, do we have everyone back? Mm -hmm. Yeah, oh. I think we lost people, a few people. <laughs> it's it's quarter, quarter to one, so. Yes, yeah, that's understandable. So uh, we, we have uh, got the author's permission to share this poster with everyone. So um, before I talk about this poster, let me um, see if I can share it. Um, share it in the chat. And while she's doing that, just by a show of hands, how many of you are already engaging in mixed methods work? Okay, okay, good. Oh, that's nice. That is great. Awesome. So um, in the previous example, uh, we show you how researchers um, try to attain their goal, which is to design a scale by collecting quantitative and qualitative data is a concurrent research design. And in this particular study, we want to give you another different example of how to, to mix quantitative and qualitative methodologies. And um, this is a study that's just being published in this course processes. Um, it's um, the study uh, happened in science classrooms in middle schools. And um, data uh, constitute by um, discussions, uh, classroom discourse data, videos. And the researchers transcribed these videos of 15 students talking about controversial social scientific issues. And they wanted to understand how different types of um, scaffolds, uh, there are two types of scaffold autonomy supportive scaffold and a less autonomy supportive scaffold. How these different types of scaffolds affect students' agency in the process of learning. Um, so they, um, they did a, a thematic analysis. Um, I think it's a content analysis. It's a qualitative content analysis and identified two types of agency disciplinary agency and learning agency. And I'm not going to uh, help you understand what these uh, constructs mean, um, but that's the qualitative component of the study. And then based on the same uh, corpus of data, they conducted some quantitative analysis. Um, there's um, a, um, it, particularly this social network analysis, trying to understand when trios of students a group of three students uh, are working together. How do these three students 
um, communicate and um, transact transact their uh, different roles and agency uh, with each other. And they look at these different transactional patterns um, under two types of scaffolds and found that um, when students had pre-constructed MEL, which is the less autonomy supportive uh, scaffold, their interactions, their agencies were less interactive compared to um, being scaffolded with more autonomy. And so mixing happens not at the data collection uh, level. Um, the data were initially qualitative. Those are videos of classroom interactions. But um, the mixing really happens during the analysis and interpretation. Um, and that's uh, the beauty of this work. Thank you, Suzanne. Are you able to make that available to folks so they can just have it in the chat? Yes, I already um, shared a link. Can everyone oh, can I see you already have download that document? That. Yes, thank you. Cool, cool. Okay, I'd like to open up now there. If there are any questions for us, um, even as you are all thinking about your own research and the ways you're thinking about um, mixing some of your research. Well, that either means we did a very good job in explaining or you're really ready to go and get some lunch. <laughs> I'm not sure which it is. I think it might be both. Okay, <laughs> so uh, thank you for the presentation. I very much appreciate it, how you gave us like foundational knowledge around uh, mixed methods, specifically um, where the mixing occurs. I think my main question, so I was aspire to do mixed methods. I have written grants toward mixed methods, but not oh, conducted yeah. that work yet. Yeah. Um, one question that I have for you all is, how did you determine where to start? So with these different types of designs, right, it allows you to start with qual and quant or start qualitative or quantitative. How did you kind of negotiate your research question and determine where to start? Um, okay, go ahead, Artie. Um, I think there are many answers to that question. Um, what I do is I tend to look at what has been done before and what am I going to, what is the primary thing that is, or, or the um, first thing that's going to add knowledge to the field. Um, and I also go with what I'm comfortable with. I'm comfortable doing quant research. So I start there, right? Um, because then I, even if I know I'm going to end up doing qualitative, I have some time to build my research team a little bit. Um, and then I, that's how I would situate my um, uh, research question. So it, it's um, researcher positionality, researcher comfort, what the field needs. Um, all of these things are really important. And I think um, another thing I want to stress is that lots of times we are always doing mixed methods research. We are just maybe not um, writing mixed methods single journal articles, right? Um, we may be studying the, um, I'm going to, um, use Jennifer's example from our um, uh, breakout room, we may be studying the experiences of Black females in medicine or in education, right? And we may be um, doing a quant study and then a qual study. And that is really a larger a mixed methods research agenda. And oftentimes we, um, there are studies that are published that are mixed methods that do both of these in one study. But I want us to look beyond a single paper to think about our research agenda, right? And to, to do what makes most sense. Again, um, I think the best answer is to obviously do the method that answers your research question. But when you are trying to strategize a little bit, um, there are other factors that we'll take into account. Um, and it is, it is, it is not um, a problem to do what is most comfortable for you first too. Um, any care I, I, yeah, I agree with Artie. I think that um, not only where you find your comfort zone, but really for me, it really is about looking at a situation and, and the impetus that I always have is how do I make it better? So what are the questions that I need to ask that'll push this forward, that'll, that'll make this uh, more 
relevant for people to put their heads around and try to move things a little bit forward in the research. But Artie is absolutely right. You know, when you, especially when you engage in mixed methods, you've opened up avenues for your entire research agenda because you can take, you know, the findings and go so many different ways. And I think that's the beauty of being a researcher, right? Really having the ability to think creatively about your work and then to explore the things you really want to know. So having the tools um, to do that, I think just makes you a stronger researcher. Emmanuel, you have a question up, I noticed. I'm sorry, Susan, did yeah. you want to? Um, no, no. Yeah, if, no just, um, a, just a contribution to the question that was asked. Uh, one aspect is also to look at the purpose. Uh, with mixed methods, the various designs have various purpose. So for instance, if she's uh, looking at using explanatory, uh, that means the purpose is to start with a quant uh, and then uh, use the results, uh, get the qual to explain the quant results in further detail. But if it's exploratory, then she starts with the uh, uh, the qualitative and right. then generalize to the to the console. These are the various purposes that uh, would decide on which design you use. And there's also a general purpose, yep. for instance, uh, to have a much more deeper understanding of, of a complex phenomenon. That's a general purpose for using mixed methods before you narrow down to the specific purposes for each of the designs. Yep, that's exactly right. Thank you, Emmanuel. Right. And then I just want to reiterate that um, the reason why we came up with the title of this presentation is to really emphasize mixed methods as a way to help researchers think about a phenomenon from multiple perspectives. Um, I came from a very quantitative background, and I know the strength of quantitative research. And oftentimes, I, um, as with um, Karen and Artie said, I started with my something that's within my comfort zone. But um, I'm not contained with just the, the, the way I'm already, the things that I'm, I, I'm already good at. I always push myself to, to ask some questions that I never thought of. Um, and those are oftentimes from a qualitative perspective. And that's how um, I, I, I saw some students here. And I think that could be a good way for st students to start with a mixed methods research. Mm -hmm. And Kristen, I really very much appreciate that you're aspiring. Um, I don't, I'm not exactly sure what your background is or where you would start qual or, or quant, but the fact that you're interested in exploring on that other side of your, um, your cognitive ability is, is exciting to me. Yeah. Thank you. That leads to my next question and something that I already mentioned in that um, in my own personal work, I have done work starting qual qualitative. And mm -hmm. I was like, oh, this is really interesting. I want to kind of scale up and see what happens and then move quantitative. But it wasn't a part of the same study, mm -hmm. but it was like the same scholarly interest. Does that yeah. make sense? Mm -hmm. yeah. So my related question is like, what are some common misconceptions that people have when approaching mixed methods research? Oh, that's a good question. I can give you a list. <laughs> uh, well, like I stated earlier, I, it was it when I came into the field, it was very shocking to me that there was this polarization. I did not understand it, um, that there was like people who did qual only and people who did quant only. And it was like the two never really interacted. And, and there was almost a little bit of a, I don't want to say disrespect of the other, but there was this sense of, you know, uh, ownership over a field. Um, so I just thought that was a little odd, you know, because we have so many questions that we need to get answers to. So one of the misconceptions I believe there is, is that you can only do one and that you can only do one well. That's not true. Um, you can do two, you can do three, and you can do um do them all very well. You just have to make sure that your design is well done. And as already mentioned earlier, um, if you have a lack or you have an area you want to strengthen or make sure that it's right, um, mixed methodologists are, are collaborative. So there's, there's conversations that we have with one another about, you know, this doesn't look right. You know, did I do this right? Or is this something that I should be thinking about differently in this work? So the misconception would be one that you have to know it all two, that you can only do it one way, and then three, that you really can't engage the other side, you know, of your, of your cognitive uh, ability to uh, explore interesting or things that are interesting to you. 
One um, practical misconception that I have found a lot is that um, people think that they can add one sort of bit of data point that might might get them a little bit more, and that is uh, mixed methods. So they have a sort of a, a Likert based scale, and then they ask add one open ended question that is like, give me any extra thoughts. And now all of a sudden they think that that becomes a mixed methods. No, that is still a survey design and you just happen to have one qualitative question. Similarly, um, if um, people are doing um, interviews and you decide to interview 10 people and you really wanted that thick, rich description, but then you are summarizing who was in your, um, you know, your population pool and you do some sort of, um, you, you give me some numbers, like there were five women and and three three men and um, one person or two people did not respond, right? That does not make your study mix methods that you are putting in some numbers. And I think um, looking beyond just the data and the type of data that you get is really important to uh, as a misconception. That may be the first and the surface level step to go to, but um, a survey with one single open-ended question or even two or three open-ended questions does not make a mixed method survey or does not make a mixed method study. It makes a maybe a a, a, a better survey, but it that is not necessarily mixed. Yeah, and another Perfect. common misconception is the difference between mixed methods and multiple methods approach. Um, and the three of us talked about this earlier in the summer. Um, we consider mixed methods as one of multiple method approaches, um, but there are other types of multiple methods. Um, and the main difference between mixed methods and other types of multiple methods is this, where does missing occur? If there's no mixing at all in the study, then that's not, not, that's not a mixed method. Right. I just want to say one more thing, too. There is a common misconception that I've noted in the field, too, that um, quantitative researchers tend not to do Black work. And that is not true. Um, there's an entire branch of, of work around quant crit, which is critical race, you know, um, quantifying critical race issues. And um, qualitative work is just as rigorous as quantitative work. It really does depend on what kind of question you're trying to get at. And we have strong black quant people and we have strong white qual people. So there's not this racial barrier that seems to, or not even the race of the researcher as much as the race of the topic, the, I mean, the topic in general. So who studies black people, you know, quantitatively? A lot of people do. And, and and you'd be surprised, but there's a misconception that there's not that many people who look, who look like you and me who study our issues quantitatively, and that's not true. Thank you. That was really helpful. Um, I am in the practice of wellness, and so if you all are inclined, I would like to close out the space so that you have minutes to transition to the next thing. Um, but thank you so much for thank you for having us. Versus lecture series it's been phenomenal. Um, I want to remind you all that this link will be posted online for those who ask for access to the slides. Um, and I hope that you join us next month for our next diversity lecture series. Um, with that being said, have yourself a great day on purpose and we will see you all soon. Thank you, Kristen. Okay.